Welcome to From His Heart, where today Pastor Jeff Shreve is in his new series, Beyond Amazing, Understanding the Grace of God. Are you a Christian legalist? That's not what God desires. Join us as we discover three ways out of the ditch of legalism. Chuck Swindoll tells about a story, a true story, about a man that used to be in his church. When he was a younger man, he was involved in a church that had Scandinavian roots, and this, this man began to work with the students and the student ministry. This was a number of years ago. Well, the church with the Scandinavian roots was very rigid in how they viewed things. And so this man who was more creative and uh, less rigid, he began to work with the students. And, and one night he said, well, I'm going to show the students a, a movie about the life of this missionary. It was a wholesome, uh, gospel-centered movie, but he showed this movie. About an hour later, he got called into the office of the pastor and the leaders of the church. And they were very upset with him, and they said, what did you do tonight? He said, what do you mean? He said, we have word that you showed a movie to our students. And he said, yeah, I showed a missionary movie. And they said, we don't do that in our church. And he said, well, wait a minute. He said, just a few weeks ago, we had a missionary come, and he showed slides. He had a slide presentation. And one of the church officers put his hand up, and he said, stop talking. He said, listen, if it's still, it's fine. If it moves, it's sin. <laughs> you can show slides, but when they start moving, you're getting into sin. Isn't that amazing? Now, that's obviously from a number of years ago, but that church was like many churches in that they had strict rules about what you can do and what you can't do. We're in a series titled Beyond Amazing. It is uh, a series on understanding the grace of God. And today we want to talk about the issue of legalism, the ditch of legalism. Setting up rules that you have to follow in order to walk with the Lord. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who travel on the broad road. But the gate is narrow and the way is the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few there be that find it. The Christian life is a walk on the narrow road, and the narrow road is paved with grace and truth. Jesus came. He was full of grace and truth. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ, and the narrow road is paved with grace and truth. But on the narrow road, there's a ditch on the right and a ditch on the left. I think I have a picture of the narrow road, not the narrow road, but a narrow road. <laughs> and you can see from this narrow road, you have a ditch on the right and a ditch on the left. Now, the ditch on the right, it is easy to, uh, to fall off the narrow road, not to lose your salvation, but to fall into the ditch of legalism on the right, we'll say, or to fall in the ditch on the left of license. We're not under law. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, we're under grace. But as you walk the narrow road of grace and truth, beware the ditch of legalism, beware the ditch 
of license, a license to sin. Now, today we want to talk about the ditch of legalism. Next week, we're going to talk about the ditch of license. Two extremes, two ditches on either side of the narrow road that leads to life. The ditch of legalism. Do you know much about legalism? Is living your Christian life just with rules? Could it be that you have fallen into the ditch of legalism? Could you be a legalistic Christian? I, I ran across a little test so that you can tell, you can kind of test yourself to see if perhaps you are in the ditch of legalism. Seven questions. Number one, do you try to control God by being good? Do you get the idea that if you're good, then God is going to do X, Y, and Z for you? Question number two, do you get angry at God when life doesn't go as you think you deserve? Question number three, is serving God a chore and a bore and something that you have to do, not something that you get to do? Number four, do you have trouble forgiving other people? Number five, do you tend to be quick to judge others? Number six, are you a person who lacks joy in life? Number seven, do you have a tendency to elevate traditions and personal preferences over the commands of God. The ditch of legalism. We're going to see that it's real easy to fall into the ditch of legalism if you're not careful. Paul wrote the book of Galatians because he had gone on his first missionary journey. He had gone to these cities. Galatia is a region. He had gone to these cities, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. You can read about those in around 48 A.D. or so, 47, 48. And then he preached the gospel, the gospel of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, and uh, grace, the, the unmerited favor of God, and the people responded to the gospel. But then behind Paul, on the heels of Paul, came the Judaizers. The Judaizers were Jews who said, listen, if you're going to, to please God and serve God, you have to fulfill the law of Moses. And they were really big on circumcision. You have to get circumcised. Paul was preaching to Gentiles. Gentiles didn't get circumcised. Circumcision was a, a Jewish thing. But they came in and they said to these Gentiles, you can't follow God unless you're circumcised, unless you follow in the uh, laws of Moses. And so this is what Paul says beginning uh, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. These guys like circumcision so much, well, why don't they go all the way and castrate themselves? That's how stern Paul is in this letter. Why? Because people were taking the gospel of the grace of God and they were perverting it. And Paul says in chapter 1 of Galatians, even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one which we preach to you, 
Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him go to hell. That's how stern he was. That's how uh, fired up he was about what was happening in Galatia. Now, remember, Galatia is not a city. It's not like the, the church of Ephesus or the church of Colossae. Galatia is a region. We have a, a map that shows you in Paul's missionary journey, you can see between uh, the Asia and the minor on the map, you have this place called Galatia. And you have these cities in the southern part of Galatia. And so when Paul was writing to the Galatians, he's writing to these churches that are in this region. And he's sharing these things with them because that's where he went on his first missionary journey and the Judaizers followed him. Paul says about these, uh, these Judaizers, Galatians 2, 4, but it was because of the false brethren. These aren't true Christians. These are emissaries from hell. Because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. That's why he says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery, to a yoke of bondage. Remember what Jesus said to those people who are all burdened down, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, it's gracious, it's kind, and my burden is light. So here's our question for today. What is the ditch of legalism? And why is it so dangerous? Why is Paul so fired up as he talks about this issue? Three discoveries this morning. Discovery number one, the ditch of legalism is adding the works of the law to grace. That's what it is. Adding works to grace. So the Judaizers said to these new believers that started out really well, put their faith and trust in Jesus, were overwhelmed by the, uh, the grace of God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And they came in and they said to them, oh, wait a minute, time out. This is what Paul didn't tell you. You have to follow the law of Moses. All you guys have to get circumcised. You have to start towing the line or you can't continue on with the Lord. Legalism tries to take works and combine it with grace. Now, you mark this down. Grace and the works of the law are mutually exclusive. Those things don't mingle together. See, there are two ways to go when you want a relationship with God. There's a way that takes you to God, and that is the way of grace. But there's another way to go, and that's the way of works, the works of the law. Well, that road leads off a cliff. That road never gets to God. But what you don't have is a road that's grace and works together. Grace and works, uh, don't, do, they don't meet. They don't somehow meet and mingle and meld together. They're two opposite roads. This is what Paul said in Romans eleven six. But if it is by grace... Grace, the unmerited favor of God. Grace, the unearned favor of God. You don't uh, earn it. You don't deserve it. But God gives it to you anyway. If it is by grace, what is the it? Salvation. If salvation is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now, works is merit. Works is I got to do this and this and this and this and this. And then God will uh, receive me. God will accept me. Grace says, it's none of that. You, God, God, it's unmerited favor, unearned favor. So if it is by the unmerited favor of God that we're saved, it's no longer based on works because works is merit. And if you take merit and mix it with unmerit, well, then you destroy the whole concept of grace, the unmerited favor of God. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And if it is by works, it is no longer on the basis of grace. Otherwise, works is no longer works. Those things are mutually exclusive, grace 
and works. And here's the thing. You come by grace to God or you don't come at all. There's only one way to peace through the power of the cross. And the Judaizers were saying, no, 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 you, you have to add works to grace. Now, remember this. The law, the Mosaic law, was never designed to save anyone. You say, what's the point of the law of Moses? Was that to save people? No. It shows Israel how they were to live, but the law was not given to save the law was given to show every single person, hey, you know what? Newsflash, you don't measure up. You missed the mark. You are a sinner. And Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sins shall die. So Paul says in Galatians 3, 24, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. The law shows you that you are a sinner, a helpless, hopeless sinner. And so your only hope is not by doing more works of the law. Your only hope is in Jesus who died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Your only hope is in God's grace. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Now, Paul says in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus... Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's not the purpose of the law. I've told you before, the law is it's like a thermometer. I think everybody in this room probably has a thermometer in their house. You know, and when you're starting to feel sick, you're starting to feel hot, what do you do? Uh, you get the thermometer out. Well, I got to see what kind of a fever I have. I feel like I have a fever. Sometimes you, you feel like you have a fever and, and you, the thermometer says, no, you don't have a fever. But other times the thermometer is like, man, you got a fever big time. And the only solution is more cowbell. No, you got a fever. That's a little joke. And... Uh, and so you, you say, okay, uh, I, this thing is saying I'm at 103. What do I do? Well, just keep sucking on the thermometer. You know, that's dumb, right? The thermometer doesn't help you get better. It just shows you how sick you are. That's the purpose of the law. It, it, think of it this way. You know, when you're drowning in the ocean, you need a savior. You need a life a saving device. You need some kind of life preserver. Well, if you cry out for the law, what's the law? It's a boat anchor. Oh, you're drowning? Well, here, take this. Well, that's just going to send you down. The law just says you're a sinner. Here's the standard. You don't meet the standard. You're done. The soul that sins shall die. So the law was never designed to save anyone. It was designed to lead us to Christ, to show us how desperately we needed him. See, the law shows us that we are sinners in need of grace. So, what does Paul say to these people? Verse 2, I, Paul, I, Paul, I, the apostle Paul, called by God, say to you that if you guys go on and receive circumcision, then you have left the road of grace, and you've gone on the road of works, and Christ will be of no benefit to you. It, it does, I mean, you're, you're divorcing yourself from Christ and his grace. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that now you're under obligation to keep the, the whole law. And he says, you've been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now, don't get confused on that. Some people get confused on verse 4, fallen from grace. They say, well, does that mean you can lose your salvation? You fall from grace. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, there are two realms in which you can live. You can live in the realm of God's grace, unmerited favor of God. I walk by faith in the God who loves me and gave his son for me. Or I can live in this realm of works and the works of the law, and, and getting circumcised, and following all the dietary laws, and the ritualistic laws, and the sacrificial laws of Moses. Well, so if I go that route, well, I'm not in grace anymore. I'm trying to be justified and right with God through works, and that's not how a man is justified or right with God. 
For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It's a boat anchor for those who are drowning. It just takes you down. So the ditch of legalism is adding the works of the law to grace. Second discovery. The ditch of legalism is attractive to our fallen nature. Hey, let's just be honest. I I don't know a Christian on the planet throughout history that has not struggled from one degree or another with legalism. Why? Well, the Bible says, Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25, it says the same verse. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Legalism seems right to you and to me. It just seems right to our fallen nature. I mean, come on, I, you know, I mean, I, I have to do. What must I do to be saved? Remember the Philippian jailer asked Paul that. Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What, do, I have to, do I have to join a church? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? Do I have to do the other? I mean, there is no free lunch, so what must I do? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. See, there are really only two religions in the world, if we can use that word religion for uh, true faith in Christ. One is spelled do, and one is spelled done, D-O-N-E. Every every false cult is built on works. Every world religion, you study Islam, it's built on works. And there is no assurance of salvation in a cult or in a world religion that's built on works because how do you know if you've done enough? And so it's what must I do? Well, I must do more and more and more. Well, Christianity is spelled done. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin is left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What do you have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's what it is. That's grace. I remember talking to uh, a boss I had one time, and uh, he was very, very Catholic. And I shared the gospel with him. He allowed me to share the gospel with him. And when I got done, you know what he said to me? He said, that's too easy. That's too easy. Can't be like that. There's a way which seems right to a man, but the end is a way of death. It seems like we have to take God's grace and add our works to God's grace in order for us to be saved, in order for us to be right with God. That is in our fallen nature. Now, here are the dangers with that. Number one, it puts external rules above an internal relationship. Why is legalism so bad? Because it puts rules above relationship. And and see, we like the rules. There's something about our flesh that likes the rules. Why? Because then you can keep score easy. And how do I know if I'm a good Christian? Well, what does a good Christian do? Well, he watches slideshows, but he doesn't watch movies. Because you're not a good Christian if you do that. If it moves, it's sin, right? So, I know I'm a good Christian because I had a quiet time. No, I'm a good Christian because I spent 30 minutes in prayer. I know I'm a good Christian because I tithe to the penny. I figure it out. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus said, you tithe mint and dill and cumin. You, die, you tithe from your garden. I mean, count out, you count out your, your herbs and you say, okay, uh, nine of these are mine. This one's the Lord's. You know, you're just so meticulous. Well, I do this, and I do this, and I do this. I I don't uh, smoke. I don't chew. I don't go with girls that do. I'm a good Christian based on all of that. And and so we like it because it's easy to keep store, to check those boxes. Yes, I did this, and yes, I did this, and yes, I did this. And that person over there, they don't have any check marks. You know, that's this, when Jesus told Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the publican went to the temple to pray. And remember what the Pharisee said? He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. 
swindlers, liars, adulterers, uh, adulterers or, or like this tax collector over here. Well, well God, I, I pay tithes on all that I have. I fast twice a week. What a good boy am I. Remember what the tax collector said? He was standing uh, some distance away. He was just beating his breast. And he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. That tax collector went home justified, and that Pharisee just went home. He's just bragging about his check-the-box stuff to God. Hey, we like the check-the-box stuff because it makes us feel good. It's about external rules. And remember this about the Pharisees. You know, we, we talk uh, pretty negatively about the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't start out being a rotten group. They became a rotten group. They became all about rules. It didn't start out all about rules. They, they were the separated ones. They wanted to be separated to God. They wanted to be uh, pleasing to God. They wanted to live a life that, that was honoring to God. That's how they started out. But what does Paul say here? A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. A little bit of yeast. You just have to put a little bit of legalism into your uh, situation, into your church, into your walk with God, and all of a sudden it just takes over, and it leavens the whole lump of dough. Paul says here, you have been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. We're waiting for the Lord to come back. The, the hope of righteousness is the confident expectation of righteousness. As we said last week, salvation is in three parts. I was saved, justification, I'm being saved, sanctification, I will be saved, glorification. And that is we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness when the Lord delivers me, not just from the penalty of sin, not just from the power of sin, but from the presence of sin. And then he says in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but what does mean something? Faith working through love. It's all about relationship. It's all about a love relationship with God. Here's what people get really confused on the works because it's not uh, by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So people say, okay, well, if works don't matter, then I guess I just do whatever I want. Mm, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that works are not the root of salvation. They're the fruit of salvation. How can you tell if somebody's really a Christian? James says, faith without works is dead, being by itself. You show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Jesus said, you'll know them by the fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Well, of course not. So how do you know that the tree is an apple tree. You know, you go by a tree and you say, uh, I wonder what kind of tree that is. And you pull off some fruit and you bite into it and say, oh, that's apple. That must be an apple tree because it has apples. We have a pear tree in our backyard. And it, you know, it, strangest thing, it grows pears because it's a pear tree. What is a Christian? A Christian produces good fruit. To earn God's favor? No, because you have God's favor, because you belong to God, and we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Faith working through love. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about relationship. It's not about external rules. It's about a relationship with God, faith that works through our love for God. What motivates us to do good works? We love God. Am I motivated by trying to earn God's favor? No, I already have God's favor. I'm motivated by my love for God. I want to honor God. I want my life to be pleasing to him because he died for me and rose again from the dead. It's about a relationship. Legalism puts relationship underneath rules. That's why Jesus said to the Pharisees, the rule keepers deluxe, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. It's all about rules for you guys. And 
The Lord looks at the heart. See, that's the other thing that's hard for us is like, okay, if Christianity is not a check the box thing, then how do I tell if I'm doing well? Harder to tell when it's not a check the box thing. It's your heart. What's your heart attitude toward the Lord? That's what he is interested in. Interested in. The Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the Bible says the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God is looking for people who will love him with all their heart. That's the greatest commandment. Faith working through love. Our love for God supremely and our love horizontally for other people. You love your neighbor as yourself. So the ditch of legalism puts external rules above an internal relationship. Secondly, it puts personal performance above divine acceptance. I have to perform in order for God to love me. I have to perform in order for God to accept me. I like what one author said about legalism. He said, legalism promotes the earning and keeping of God's grace based on performance. Personal performance is your continuing personal atonement. So what does that mean? That means I got to do. And if I don't keep doing, then God isn't going to keep loving me. The only way God accepts me is if I'm performing. Lots of Christians get on the performance treadmill. You know, you've heard me say about the daisy theology, you know, the, the, the kids when, when I was a kid, maybe, I don't guess they do that anymore, but uh, we used to go outside and play. They don't really do that anymore either. And so, anyway, we, we would take these, you know, as a kid, you'd take these flowers and, uh, you know, here's Natalie. Oh, I like Natalie. I'm in fourth grade. I wonder if Natalie likes me. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. You remember, did you ever do that? Don't look at me like I'm nuts. Some of you people did that, Right? We do the same thing with God. Oh, man, I just got promoted. He loves me. Man, I just lost my job. He uh, he loves me not. Man, but then I got a new job. He loves me. Ah, but then I got fired. He loves me not. And it's just, it's just up and down all the time based on circumstances. And, and we have this kind of relationship with the Lord that is if I'm performing then he's going to do for me. But if I'm not performing, he's not going to do for me. And we're on the performance treadmill. And when bad things happen to you and you have the mindset of the performance treadmill and you say, God, I'm doing all these things and you're not doing right because you're not rewarding me for all these things I'm doing, you become the the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son. I've done all this for you, Dad. You've never thrown a party for me. Man, I'm just serving you, and what do I get for it? I get nothing. This this son of yours that smells like the pigs, that's wasted your wealth on, on wine, women, and prostitutes, you throw a party for him. That's not right. That's not fair because I earned your favor. God's favor is not something you earn. You can never earn it. And I can never earn it. And Paul could never earn it. And no one could ever earn it. And Nicodemus, who was the most moral man in the world at the time, sat down with Jesus. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God because there are only two ways to go. There's the way of grace, which is the way of acceptance, the way of works, which is the way to hell. That's just the bottom line. Martin Luther said this, rightly are the doers of the law called the devil's martyrs. They take more pains to earn hell than the martyrs of Christ to obtain heaven. Theirs is a double misfortune. First, they torture themselves on earth with self-inflicted penances, and finally, when they die, they gain the reward of eternal damnation. It's, It's a horrible thing. No wonder Paul said, even though we are an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the gospel of grace that we preach to you, let that person go to hell. They're leading you astray to an eternal hell. There's only one way to go that reaches God, and that is the way of grace. 
So legalism puts personal performance above divine acceptance. We, through the Spirit, by faith, is what he was talking about. But faith working through love. We, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now think about faith. Faith. What is faith? Faith is going uh, the way of God. Faith is believing God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is faith. God said it, and I believe it, and that is faith. What does God say about your acceptance? Is it based on performance? No. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Jesus is the beloved. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus is the beloved. Is the beloved. And when you accept Jesus, God accepts you. And then by faith, you say, Lord, I don't feel very acceptable, but your word says I'm accepted in Jesus. And so I'm getting off the performance treadmill. I don't have to work for your acceptance. I already have it. I just work from your acceptance. See, it's the, it's the motivation. It's, it's what you're focused on. You know, somebody can sing in the choir, and it's the way of works. They're doing that to somehow earn God's favor, and somebody else can sing in the choir, and it's pleasing to God because they're not doing it to gain God's favor. They're doing it because they have God's favor, and they're singing to him a song of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me so that I can walk with you by grace. Hey, why is it so bad, the ditch of legalism? Well, it puts external rules above an internal relationship. It puts personal performance above divine acceptance. And here's the bottom line. It is very easy to fall into the ditch of legalism. No one's immune from that. It is so easy because it seems right to a man. It seems like we have to work. As the poem says, I cannot work my soul to save that work my Lord has done, but I'll work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. And we say, well, works are important. Faith without works is dead, being by itself. Yes, but works are the fruit, not the root. And works come when we walk with God, when his power flows through us. You know how easy it is to fall into the ditch of legalism? Can I tell you? Galatians chapter 2. You know who fell into the ditch of legalism? Peter. Peter. And Paul says, I confronted Peter to his face. Because when he came to Antioch, Peter, you know, the one that had the, the vision of the sheet with the animals, the unclean animals, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, no, Lord, I'd never do that. I've never eaten a ham sandwich. I'm not going to do that. And the Lord says, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And then in Acts chapter 10, same chapter, he goes to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile. And he said, you know, I wouldn't have even come to your house. I wouldn't have walked in and, and spent any time with you at all, except God had shown me this, that what he has cleansed no longer consider unholy. He preached the gospel to Cornelius, and Cornelius and his family uh, trusted Christ. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were baptized. And it was glorious. So Peter knew that there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, slave and free man, male or female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, you know, he used to eat ham sandwiches with the Gentiles until the party of the circumcision came down from Jerusalem. And he feared the party of the circumcision, so he started withdrawing, saying, I can't eat with you guys. No more ham sandwich for me with the Gentiles. I can't do that anymore. I got, I got to straighten up because these Jews are around me. And Paul said, I confronted him to his face. He fell into the ditch of legalism. That's not a command of God, Peter. You're doing that because you're fearing men and you're separating yourself from Gentile believers because of the law of Moses. That's not what we do. Jerry Bridges, who wrote a book about the grace of God, he talks about how he fell into the ditch of legalism. So he's supposed to preach at this church. He comes to the church 15 minutes before he's getting ready to preach, and they tell him, they said, hey, uh, just the other day, a couple days ago, we had a staff member die. The church is in, uh, they're just in, in mourning. They need a word of encouragement. 
Well, he was going to talk to them about discipleship. That was his sermon. And so he's thinking, man, that's just not going to work. I got to come up with a different sermon. And so uh, he began to pray. And he said, just instinctively, he said, man, I got to ask God to give me this just like that. Did I have a quiet time today? Have I had any lustful thoughts today? Has my walk with the Lord been really good in the last few days for me to ask this big prayer, God, give me a sermon in 15 minutes? And then he caught himself and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, do I come to God based on my performance or do I come to God based on the performance of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? We can come boldly before his throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has everything to do with his performance. We are accepted in the beloved and the beloved is Jesus. Amen. Now remember this, very important. See, most of us know that you don't want to do bad things in the flesh. Galatians 5. We're going to finish Galatians 5 next week. But the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, drunkenness, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, and things like these. We know those are bad. Man, you do that, you're not going to be walking with God if you're doing that because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I mean, that is a truism. You can't just say, well, grace covers all that. No, you've fallen into the ditch of license if you do that. So we know it's wrong to do bad in the flesh, but what we don't know is it's just as wrong to do good in the flesh. And here's how the devil is so insidious. He said, oh, you don't want to do these things. This is bad in the flesh. But let me tell you, why don't you do these things because this is good in the flesh, and then you can look good, and then you can please God, and you can get acceptance with God. Jesus said, that which is of the flesh is flesh. God hates the flesh. He hates it. What is the flesh? It's self. You take the word F-L-E-S-H, and knock the H off of it and spell it backwards, S-E-L-F. The flesh is self. It's all about me, the big I. God hates anything that's of self. And whether you do bad in the flesh, God hates that. Or whether you do good in the flesh, God hates that. He doesn't want you to do anything in the flesh. He wants you to do everything in the spirit. What burns up at the judgment seat of Christ? Anything done in the flesh. And see, that's why you can preach a sermon in the power of the flesh, it counts for nothing. Or you can preach a sermon in the power of the Holy Spirit, it counts for everything. It's what, who are you doing this for? What is your motivation? Are you in the flesh or in the spirit? So the ditch of legalism, adding the works of the law to grace, the ditch of legalism, attractive to our fallen nature, to the pride, to the big eye, look what I did. Sounds right, seems right. And discovery number three, very quickly, the ditch of legalism is overcome by standing firm in Jesus. Stand firm in Jesus. Look at one, verse one. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. What's the freedom that we have in Jesus? Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from condemnation. Freedom from the performance trap and the performance treadmill. Freedom from comparison. How am I doing compared to this person or, or that person or the other person? Free to live and serve God from a right heart. Now remember, the flow of God's grace comes only by faith. You want God's grace to flow through you? And Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, abide in me. We abide in the Lord and his, his life-flowing slap throws, flows through us so that we can bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciples. It's by faith. Jesus, uh, Paul says this to the Galatians in chapter 3. You foolish Galatians, you bunch of dummies. It's kind of paraphrased. Uh, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is one thing I want to know from you. You ready? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing, by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Which was it? 
Well, they'd say, well, we, we started out with the hearing with faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? That doesn't make sense. You came through the road of God's grace, faith in God's grace, and now you're wanting to get out of that and go into works. No, it is grace that saves, it is grace that sanctifies, it is grace that glorifies, it is grace all the way. And a thousand years from now in heaven, we'll still be singing about his amazing grace, that he would save a wretch like me. It's all of grace. Yeah. The flow comes from faith. See, grace is God's acceptance of you, and faith is your acceptance of God's acceptance of you. God says that I accept you in the blood. You accept my son, I accept you. Doesn't mean God is pleased with everything we do. He's not. I'm not pleased with everything my kids do. I'm not pleased with everything my wife does. Uh, but I love my kids. I love my wife. They're accepted. God says, I accept you. Grace, God's acceptance of you. Faith, your acceptance of God's acceptance of you, just like you are. As my friend Guy Dowd said, he learned as a big, heavy set guy that got made fun of. He said, When I came to Christ, I learned that God loved me, fat slob me. And Jesus died for me, fat slob me. And I gave my heart and life to Him. Hey, that's how you start in the Christian life. That's how you continue in the Christian life. We don't grow into grace, but we do grow in grace. Because there's nothing you can do to get God's grace other than repent and believe. You just put your faith and trust in him. And the joy of the Christian life is found in the truth of the cross. That's what Paul says in verse 10. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his punishment, who, his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brother, and if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? They accused Paul of saying, well, you used, persec you used circumcision. You had Timothy circumcised in Acts 16, so you still use that. Paul did have Timothy circumcised because his mother was Jewish. And Paul took Timothy with him, and he knew, hey, the Jews aren't going to receive anything he says since he is Jewish background and has not been circumcised. That's why he did that. He didn't do that so Timothy would gain favor with God. He did that in order to be a more effective witness. But they say, well, Paul, you, you preach circumcision. No, I don't preach circumcision. If I preach circumcision, then why am I still persecuted? I mean, I'd get along hunky-dory with the Judaizers if I preached circumcision, but I don't. I lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. That's a stumbling block for the Jews. That's a scandalon. That's the, the Greek word scandalon, stumbling block. It's an offense. Well, what do you mean? Why is it an offense? Because the Messiah is supposed to be the conqueror. He's not supposed to be the crucified. They were looking for somebody that takes over. Hey, when the Messiah comes, he's going he's gonna to kick butt on the Romans, and we're going to be in charge again. And Israel's going to be on top. We're not going to be on bottom anymore. And here comes the Messiah, and what does he do? He goes to the cross. The preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's, it's foolishness to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are like, good grief. That's your king? The guy that gets crucified, the guy that it, it, it gets the, the sentence of the most wicked of criminals, and that's the one you worship? For the preaching of the cross, the Bible says, is the power of God. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Hey, how do you avoid the ditch of legalism? You walk squarely on the narrow road of grace and truth, and you look 
every day at the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Listen. Are you in the ditch of legalism? Are you trying to earn your way with God? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. If you're here and you've never been saved, you can put your faith and trust in Jesus today, and you can be saved just like that. If you're a Christian and you've fallen into the ditch of legalism, you can get out of it just like that as you start walking by faith with the one who loves you, who says you're accepted in the beloved, who says to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you ever received God's amazing grace? Have you ever had all your sins forgiven and your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If not, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, make me the person you want me to be, and I make the commitment to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, so take the time to contact me and we'll pray for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.